Chapter 20 Father, Mother, Brother In the cool silence of his room, Jie was dozing in the morning sunlight. He stirred as someone knocked on the door. His brother walked in, dressed in travelling clothes. Is it that time already? asked Jie. It would seem so, said Ie, sitting down on the bed. Still alive, I see. As far as I know, grinned Kie. I heard Tepid's going back to Nausea. That's right. He'll be travelling on the canal. It leads straight to the sea. You'll have to get a look before you leave. It's quite impressive. I'm sure it is, said Kie, blowing a few stray hairs out of his eyes sleepily. But I'll be happier when I see Feldnor again. Are you looking forward to getting back? Well, actually, I'm not heading home just yet said Ie. I'll have to catch you up. His brother looked up. Oh, how come? I have to do some work. That book I read all through our journey was pretty valuable, and I did steal it after all. So I've got to make up for what's missing. But the book was destroyed. Make up for its value. Oh, how much was it worth? Enough. How long will that take? Tepid says twenty-four times will do, said Ie hesitantly. Where I'll stay isn't actually part of the prison. Apparently it's part of his castle. I'll be allowed out every now and then, to stretch my legs and have a look around the city, you know? I'm quite lucky, really. I got off lightly. Kie felt his heart sink. He had been looking forward to them travelling home and seeing Failnor again together. The thought of being there without his brother felt strange, like walking without a shadow. He didn't want to be on his own. He wanted to put up a fight, say it was wrong, and stand up for his brother. But it seemed to be a battle waiting to be lost. There was an expectant tap on the door. They're waiting, said Ie, making to get up. The boats leave soon. Um, I'll say goodbye for now. Oh, all right then, said Hie. Are you going to be all right? He added suddenly. Ie paused. He appeared to struggle inwardly for a moment. I'm, I'm scared. I don't know what to do. I'm so glad you're healing and I know you'll be all right. That's what counts. But I just wish things were like they were before. Well, before everything. Before father left. Before we were stuck together, grew up and everything happened. I wish I could be friends with Gina again. I don't know what I'm supposed to feel. I still get nightmares about what happened. But I don't know how to make friends again. I always wanted her to come back so badly. I thought if she did, our lives would go back to the way they were. Things changed, but I wake up every day feeling this pain in my chest. And I don't know why it's there. It's so hard. I worry about everything and you. I want to be happy again. If he could, Ie would have said all of this out loud. But it was a churning mass of things he couldn't articulate. Eventually, all he said was, I'm just a bit tired. Kie smiled kindly. He knew his brother too well. It will get better. Mm. It will, all right? It will. She missed you too, you know? Added Kie. That's why she came back. Ie gave him a searching look, but Kie wasn't teasing. There was another, firmer tap from outside. Time was getting on. Keep out of trouble, little brother, said Ie, pausing by the door. Kie grinned. You know me, big brother. I always do. Ie gave a small nod and a smile, then disappeared through the door. Kie heard the sound of his brother's footsteps along with those of his guards fading down the passage. He listened before turning his head towards the window. In that small moment, he gently became aware how the room felt a little emptier. A sense of loneliness crept in as he watched the light falling through the glass. 
Somewhere down the long hallway, he knew his twin felt exactly the same as he walked, flanked by two guards, towards the gates of Queen Peony's citadel. Boats stood waiting in the canal, ready to take the Norseans, their prince, and one failed notion down the winding route through the mountains to Norsea. The clouds and mist made everything look grey. Autumn was making way for winter, and the air felt cooler. Prince Tepid and his envoys were having one last discussion with the mountain people before embarking. The guards and their prisoner quietly waited on their boat for His Highness to board the royal barge. At that moment, Ie looked up as someone appeared at the boat's rail. It was Kina. Briefly, without a word, they shook hands in goodbye. Then, before the guards good-naturedly stepped in to part them, Kina gave him the briefest of hugs. Ropes were untied and timbers creaked. The gap between them grew as the boat moved away. But as he looked up at the receding banks of the canal, Ie found himself feeling ever so slightly better. Up in his room, Kie heard the mournful sound of the horns bidding the boats farewell. Then he looked round as Delilah entered the room, followed by Abrian with Pippa the dragon. They were talking animatedly together, joking and discussing their journey home. As he watched Delilah, with her bright eyes and how they crinkled at the edges when she laughed, Kie found himself smiling with them. Life had begun to move again, and was about to pick him up and sweep him along with it. The route out of the mountains was a hard trek on foot. Their paths were laid with heavy stones marking the way. Kie caught glimpses of golden hills laced with rich heather and drifting mist that glided through the cold air as he dozed, carried by his friends on a stretcher. He had no strength to walk that journey, but the ATR still had to keep telling him to shut up whenever he apologised. As the first day drew on, Dominator walked quickly to catch up with Abrian. Hey... Do you think Annie will be all right? He whispered. She was acting really strange in the mountains. Hey! The two of them turned and saw Hono trying to pull Annie out of a bag of food by her ankles. When she eventually appeared, bread was sticking out of her mouth and some had got stuck in her hair. (laughs) I think she'll be fine, Abrian laughed. In four days, they had journeyed through the foothills of the glass mountains and reached the plains. Then, steadily, Feldnor came into view. It was there, as always, as if it said to them, So, you've finally come back. I'm still here, just like I said I would be. There were failed notions waiting for them. News had spread that they were coming home. The White Queen knew they were on their way back before anyone else, of course, and looked rather smug about it. Some of the failed notions, with Carew at the front, cheered as they reached the tree line. The ATR felt a little bemused and grinned sheepishly. Except for Dominator and Annie, who soaked up the attention like sponges. Delilah was suddenly engulfed by a rush of blue as Evlu zoomed down from the canopy to greet her sister, delighted to have her back. In the noise, Gina felt a bit overwhelmed. Suddenly she realised at that moment how much she wanted to see her sisters, and especially her mother. She knew she had some serious explaining to do, but it would be nothing compared to the amazing story she had to tell. Whispering a quick goodbye to her friends, she quietly slipped out of the throng and into the trees, a soup flask dangling from her travelling pack. The White Queen looked on, aloof as always. Delilah gave her a wave, while Evelu still zoomed all around her, talking non-stop. Someone else stood close by the White Queen, keeping to the shade. After a nudge from the Queen, they cautiously stepped forwards. Lying on his stretcher, Kie turned his head and saw, for the first time in an age, his father. All Jam could do, it seemed, as his eyes fell on his son, lying immobile yet alive and well, was blink, then glanced nervously towards the White Queen. He shuffled back to her and whispered, Are you sure? Me. She took hold of his shoulders and turned him back towards Kie. Jam didn't seem to know what to do or think. His eyes flicked from Kie's limp legs, to Delilah laughing with Evelu circling happily around her, to the faces of the rest of the ATR as they talked happily with Carew and the other failed notions. Kie watched his father, too tired to wonder what strange story had brought him back from the netherworld. He felt sure the White Queen had something to do with it.
Finally, Kiam spoke. I don't suppose you can shake hands? Kie shook his head. Not yet. Ah. There was a protracted pause. Would you like some help? Kiam asked tentatively. I think I'll be all right, said Kie, not meeting his eye. Kiam raised an eyebrow ever so slightly, with the smallest of smiles. You're very brave. Kie looked back at him, not quite sure what to say. His father reached down to place a tentative pat on his arm. Very brave, he said again, as a flicker of sadness crossed his face. Kie watched him carefully. Thanks, he said at length. Jam glanced back at him, the shadow replaced by a glimmer of hope. After another moment's pause, he looked about at the rest of the ATR, then back at Kie. Tell me, he said. Didn't there used to be two of you? Somewhere in the trees, the White Queen smacked her forehead with her hand. He had been doing so well. Kie frowned, looking slightly downcast. He's not coming home yet. Why not? asked Kiam. Overdue library book. Kiam rolled his eyes. It would be, wouldn't it? Well, one at a time, I suppose. Pardon? Jam took hold of Kie's foot and wrenched it upright. Kie yelped in shock. Eh, that feels strange. Ah, but you can feel. Jam looked pleased. That's a start. I thought I'd stay with Delilah until I can move properly, winced Kie. Delilah will soon have enough to manage, said the White Queen, her eyes twinkling. Fear not, I will take care of her. You, my dear Joji, will stay in the care of your father while you heal. Do you know what you're doing? said Chie, glancing suspiciously at the White Queen. Parenting has nothing to do with knowing what you're doing, said Kiam, wagging a finger at Chie. I am using my imagination. The castle felt almost strange to come back to. Abrian and Hono stood in the doorway while Annie and Dominator flew about the hall, bouncing off the ceiling. Morphia slung their travelling bags out of the way and headed straight to her room, eager to ensure her private things remained untouched. Well, we didn't die, said Abrian cheerfully. Kie did. Kie is an exception to the rule. And now we're back, sighed Hono, looking around at their home. Yep. We're back, agreed Abrian. They stood, watching Pippa flying after Morphia, who was hiding some tempting gemstones she'd picked up in the mountains. Well, I suppose we'd better see what kind of state the kitchen's in. Hono slung his bag down in a corner. It's a bit odd, though, he added. What is? asked Abrian, and then gasped. Snapping turtle! he cried. Hono ducked as Abrian's pet made a dive at him from the rafters. Just odd that I didn't see Aunt Bolivia when we arrived, he said, straightening up and plucking the little turtle off his foot. You'd better remind me to visit them later. Hono! Gina was standing in the doorway, looking out of breath. Oh, what's biting your foot? she asked, staring at the turtle. Never mind the turtle! Mogwing had run up behind Gina. Hono, we need you! It's nice to see you too, Mog. Betrin's baby is coming! I... what? Hono didn't have time to speak as Mogwing seized him and dragged him out the door. Amar, Betrin's partner, was standing outside Aunt Bolivia's house. His nose was red and there were shadows under his eyes. He looked as if he was the one having the child. What are you doing out here? demanded Hono. I can't go in, said Amar, staring wildly at Hono. I've got a winter cold. I mustn't go near them. But she's in there. And it's you she needs right now. Me? Yes, you. And Mogwing shoved Hono through the door and snapped it shut. Betrin was by the fireside. All the usual chairs had been pushed out of the way. She looked exhausted. Aunt Bolivia stroked her forehead soothingly. Hono! Betrin cried. Hono, please come here. I'm scared. Hono couldn't believe his eyes. This was Betrin, wasn't it? 
veteran who was never afraid of anything, who teased him to oblivion, who was so excited to be having a baby. Hono barely recognised her. She had beads of sweat on her forehead, and her face was pale. All right, it's all right, he said as he knelt beside her, trying to speak as calmly as possible while his insides felt like they were melting. Um, you're doing really well. Don't talk nonsense, Hono! Betrin shouted, seizing his hand in a vice-like grip as a wave of pain came over her. I don't know what I'm doing! It hurts! Her eyes welled up as the pain subsided again. I don't want to do this anymore! She sobbed. Shh! Yes, you can, said Bolivia softly. I can't! shouted Betrin, screwing up her face against another wave of pain, tears streaming down her cheeks. I can't! Well, you haven't got a choice! Hono shouted, drowning her out. Aunt Bolivia looked up in surprise. He knew he was taking his life in his hands. Saying his prayers to himself, he looked Betrin dead in the face. The only way to stop it hurting is to have that baba. But it's not going to happen unless you put your head back on right now! Betrin stared at him with wide, tear-soaked eyes. But something seemed to have got through. We're all right here with you, said Hono firmly, giving her hand a little shake. Yes? His eyes flicked to his aunt's and took courage from the small glow of pride he saw there. Betrin nodded weakly, squeezing his fingers tight. Yes. Right. I don't know anything that's happening, so do what your body tells you. Don't fight it. I'm scared, Honor. I'm so scared. Not as much as I am. Another wave came over Betrin. Hono and Bolivia held her tight as she gritted her teeth with pain and effort. Abrian reached Aunt Bolivia's house first, with Morphia, Annie and Dominator close behind, all of them wondering what had happened to make Hono run off. The answer came through the open windows. It was something they'd never heard before, but knew instantly what it was. It came from a tiny pair of lungs that had just breathed in cold, fresh air for the first time. The door opened and Hono staggered out, his face white. Abrian and Morphia caught him before he fell over. <laughs> well done, laughed Abrian happily. Look at you being all grown up. Hono didn't have time to draw breath before Amar had flung himself on his shoulders. Thank you, he said swiftly. Thank you so much. Don't mention it, said Hono weakly. Amar released him and dashed to the door to peek in. They could just see Betrin, looking shaken, but smiling. You'll be in demand now, said Dominator, patting Hono on the back. You wait, they'll be lining up outside the castle. Whoa, steady now! Hono's legs had gone from under him. Three and a half times later. Ie sat surrounded by papers and charts. Prince Tepid's castle was quiet for that time of season. He liked to keep the window open so he could hear the seagulls and the wind outside. Most of the time he watched the clouds roll by. It was nice to watch them from the camp bed that lay in the corner of this tower room where he was confined to work. He shifted a stack of parchment and paused for a moment, checking a long tally beside him. One hundred and four days so far. Someone was walking up the stairs. He could hear the creak of woodwork. The Norseans weren't all bad. In fact, most of the errand runners were fine people. Ie just hadn't got the hang of speaking affably to them yet. He dipped his quill back into the inkwell and bent his nose over another long chart bearing a list of beeswax candle sales to different traders. A letter for you, Master Failed Notion. A folded scroll slid onto his charts. I have been instructed to inform you that your sentence has been partially paid for. What? Ie looked up, startled. I couldn't pronounce their name, young master, but a person has made arrangements with the council and his highness. You're to stay here for fourteen times now, not twenty-four. Who made arrangement? Uh, what do you mean, not twenty-four? Ie spluttered, but the errand runner had already scuttled away. He put the quill to one side and peeled open the letter, utterly astonished. 
Inside was a short message, written in untidy, blotted handwriting. Dear Eldred, It's taken so long, but I can finally write on my own. Delilah says my handwriting just needs practice. Home is like nothing you could imagine. Lots of exciting things have happened here, and I can't wait for you to get back. Although I think Gina is still the most antsy. We've caught her trying to sneak off and get to you several times. Hono wasn't impressed, to say the least. I don't know if the Norseans told you, but someone's been able to pull some strings. Turns out our f- Our- Daddy- Several words had been crossed out here. EA couldn't read them. Someone we know is owed a serious favour by the Norseans. I can't say who right now. I think it's better you find out for yourself. But I think you'll be out of there a lot sooner now. I hope by then I can visit- we could even walk back home together. Oh, and in the meantime, Delilah has written you some more puns in case you're having trouble making friends. Bother, I'm running out of parchment, but I hope this gets to you quickly and finds you well. I'll see you soon. Your brother, Joji Aloysius. P.S. I almost forgot. When you come back, there will be two important people you have to see. Trust me, they'll want to meet their uncle. The End A story by R&M Manga Do you like mangoes? Not really, no. Neither do I. Yeah, must mm. be an Aloysius thing. I didn't think they know what mangoes are either. Probably not. And they'll never understand what rabbits are. Oh no, my two are so cute. I know. Did you hear about that guy who got rescued by the RNLI? Oh yeah! Wasn't he like a Scots bloke? Something like that, babbling about whippets. Hmm. I wonder what in the world a whippet is. Hmm. I do love fluffy kittens. Oh, yes. Now, what shall we do now? Hmm. I think I might visit Feldnor again at some point. Well, I'm going to go and find a pub. It's called the Apple Tree, apparently. Sounds lovely. Sounds nauseant to me, but I'll tell you how it goes. Oh, very much, yes. Now, if you'll excuse me... I've got to go and talk to somebody about writing another book. Okay. Have fun. See you soon. <laughs>